What on earth has happened to Southampton? Just over two years ago, they found themselves fourth in the league, only two points off a top spot, with the side having impressed in a Premier League for years previously. Between 2014 and 2017, they saw four top eight finishes in a row, even reaching a record-breaking sixth place in 2016. However, since then, the Saints have become synonymous with one word, inconsistent. Despite having been fourth in December 2020, as I mentioned, they would go on to finish 15th after a run of just two wins in 17 games. And now, two years down the line, things haven't changed for the side, as over halfway through the current campaign, the Saints are rock bottom of the league and look destined for relegation back to the championship. This is the story of Southampton's remarkable rise and fall. If we rewind to 2009, we can see a Southampton side on the verge of collapse, having been placed into administration and looking destined for at least relegation to the fourth tier, if not worse. However, then in came Southampton's superhero, as the Saints were saved by businessman Marcus Lieber. Lieber took over a club in shambles with no scouting or recruitment strategy, and when he then appointed Alan Pardew as manager in July 2009, the former Newcastle man said they had no tapes or records of anything and that the team had to start from scratch. Lieber also made Italian businessman Nicola Cortese executive chairman of the club, who demanded good performances on the pitch, despite the fact that they started with a 10-point deduction. Over the coming summer, key transfers were made, with the likes of Ricky Lambert, Jose Font and Jason Punchin joining a squad featuring Lallana, Oxlade Chamberlain and Morgan Schneiderlin, with nobody knowing what to expect from the season. The Saints then started their campaign awfully, going winless for the first seven games and were rooted to the foot of the table with relegation looking more and more likely as each week went by, before an incredible run of form saw them finish just one place below the playoffs. Not only this, but Southampton had been able to tempt Les Reed away from the FA, who oversaw incredible progression in the Saints Youth Academy, scouting, recruitment and sports science departments, bringing in an analytical black box system that I'll talk about later on. Moving back onto the on-pitch side of things, and their incredible turnaround in the league wouldn't even be the main success story of their season, as on the 28th of March, they'd qualified for the Johnston Paint Trophy final, where they'd gone to beat Carlisle 4-1, apparently keeping Alan Pardew in his job. And tragically, going into the new season, Marcus Lieber passed away, with his daughter Katerina taking over his role. A few weeks later, and Cortese would sack Alan Pardew, despite having just won 4 0 against Bristol Rovers away from home, with a decision deemed as essential if the side wanted to reach their well known targets by Cortese. Come September, Nigel Adkins was now in charge, where he was able to guide the Saints up to a second place finish and therefore promotion to the Championship. Oxlade Chamberlain then became the first big name sale by the club, with Arsenal buying the then 17 year old for £15 million, with the money they received going on to enable their second promotion in a row, as the club led the championship pretty much the whole way through to the end of the season, when with just three games left they'd be pipped to top spot by Reading. Not only this, but at the start of the year, Paul Mitchell would join the club as head of recruitment, a decision which would go on to be very fruitful for the Saints. Following their promotion, Mitchell brought in the likes of Jay Rodriguez, Stephen Davis, Nathaniel Klein, Maya Yoshida and even more, who would all go on to become very important players for the Saints over the coming season. A poor start then saw them bottom of the league after 10 games, however an upturn of form saw them 15th come mid-January, where once again Cortese would shock the world by sacking Adkins, following an impressive 2-2 draw against Chelsea with the Saints unbeaten in their last five. Although in hindsight, this was another great decision by the Italian. Maurizio Pochettino would then take over, guiding them to 14th place come the end of the season, following a run which saw just two losses in their last 10 games, however also saw them go winless for the final six. Nonetheless, in the following summer, Dejan Lovren, Victor Wanyama and Dani Osvaldo were all brought in, with two of them being very successful at the club, and the other one being Dani Osvaldo. And then, after a strong start to the season, Pochettino was able to guide them to an impressive 8th place finish in the Premier League, with Cortese having left his role in January. The Italian had done an incredible job on the south coast, so much so that even after he left, the club was able to build even further despite a summer window which saw them lose the likes of Pochettino, Lambert, Shaw, Lallana, Lovren and Chambers, with Paul Mitchell also departing after the window had shut. Replacing them though, we saw the likes of Koeman, Tadic, Pella, Forster and Mane be among their summer acquisitions, with the signings of said players being down to the mysterious black box which I mentioned earlier. So what is Southampton's black box and why is it so important? Well essentially it was a big collection of data, video highlights and so on which allowed Southampton to improve their scouting network and was used alongside recommendations of managers for example, overseeing an incredible amount of talent which came through the club. And it's fair to say for at least a little while, Southampton's black box worked incredibly. Of course, there would be other people involved in their success and it wasn't just the mysterious black box. Which by the way isn't just a black box, that would be weird. The black box is just the name of a room where they did all the business. Although I guess it is a box then because every room is pretty much just a fancy box. Moving on, a great start to Ronald Koeman's tenure saw the Saints up in second place all the way through to the end of November, with new signings like Dusan Tadic, Graziano Pella and Sadio Mane all shining at St Mary's. The Saints even found themselves in the top four going into late February, where after a little fall off in the late stage of the season they'd finish in seventh place, which was still their greatest ever finish in the Premier League. 
Importantly though, this gave them Europa League football, giving their squad a new challenge for the upcoming season, and after star players like Nathaniel Klein and Morgan Schneiderlin were sold, many pundits were saying it would be too much for them and that they'd struggle to reach the same heights as they had in 2015. Of course though, in true Southampton fashion, they replaced them with even better players for cheaper, as Oriol Romeu, a former Chelsea and Barcelona player, and Cedric Suarez came in to replace their outgoings, as well as some of their European money being spent on Dutch duo Virgil van Dijk and Jordi Klaassie alongside a couple other small signings. And for a while, it looked like the doubters were right, as after 20 games, Southampton were 13th in the table, never reaching the heights of the last season, with the side even failing to reach the Europa League group stage, having been knocked out in a playoff round by FC Micheland. However, I should mention that the majority of Southampton fans weren't too worried. In the end, rightfully so, as their team started to gel, with youth players like James Ward-Prowse and Matt Target seeing more minutes, where a spell of five wins in six games had the side up in sixth place, a position they'd hold until the end of the season. Not only had they matched their performance of the year previously, but Southampton actually improved upon it, once again setting a record finish in the Premier League. However, this would prove to be the start of the end for Southampton's incredible team, as come the end of the season, Ronald Koeman left for Everton, with Sadio Mane, Wanyama, Pele and Fonta all departing over the season as well, as the core of this Southampton side was ripped apart. Of course, this wasn't the only time Southampton had sold their stars, but it did mark the first real season where they failed to replace them properly, as most of their summer signings were gone to disappoint over their spell at the club, with Pierre Emil Hoiberg being the only real exception. Never winning more than two games in a row, Southampton fell to 8th place in the league, obviously still an impressive finish but slightly deceiving as their points tally dropped down to 46, an entire 17 lower than the season previously. Not only this, but after being knocked out of the Europa League in the group stage and seeing a devastating controversial loss in the Carabao Cup final, the Saints had clearly reached their peak and were set for a rapid decline. Claude Puel, who'd replaced Cohen at the start of the season, would be dismissed by the Saints and replaced by Pellegrino, a calamitous decision as the club found themselves in a relegation zone come March, despite having spent heavily in the summer. Alongside this, Virgil van Dijk and Jay Rodriguez, two more pivotal parts of their side, would leave over the course of that season as it looked highly likely that Southampton would be relegated. In the end, Mark Hughes would place Pellegrino just about guiding them to safety before overseeing an even worse start to the next season, being dismissed to the Saints 19th from the table. Now one thing that's important to note by now is that back in August 2017, Chinese businessman Zhao Zhisheng bought a majority 80% stake in the club following the nation's explosion into football. And in the years following, Southampton had fallen off massively, and so knowing that something needed to change in order to protect his investment, he started to make changes in the boardroom. Zhao would make himself chairman of the club, dismissing Ralph Kruger who'd replaced Cortese all the way back in 2014, something I'll bring up again later. Not only this, but he turned to Hasenhutl to keep the Saints up, something the manager would achieve with the side finishing in 16th, an improvement on their previous campaign, but still massively disappointing regardless. As well as this, Zhao dismissed Ross Wilson who'd been Paul Mitchell's replacement, which partnered with Les Reed's department in late 2018 saw Southampton in an entirely new recruitment team. And over the next couple years, it looked like Zhao's changes might have just turned them around. Hassan Hootel guided Southampton to an impressive 11th place finish in his first full season, followed up by an incredible start to the next campaign where after a 3-0 win against Sheffield United on the 13th of December, the Saints found themselves in 4th, just 2 points off at the top. Finally, after a few years of mediocrity or worse, Southampton were finally back doing what they did best, battling with the big boys at the top of the table. Oh wait, <laughs> no they weren't, how could I forget? As we then saw the Saints start the new year with just 2 wins in the next 17 games, games, dropping all the way down to a 15th place finish come the end of the season as severe inconsistency plagued Hassan Hootel's time on the south coast. We saw a second 15th place finish in a row last season where after more sales and little reinvestment the Saints struggled to find goals, as well as an awful run of form continuing into this campaign, leading to the sacking of Ralph Hassan Hootel with the club 19th in the league, the exact same position they were in when he took over almost 4 years previously. Nathan Jones was then appointed after impressing during two different spells at Luton, however so far he's failed to make the same impact in the Premier League, losing six of his first seven games in charge as they've dropped even further down the table to rock bottom. And so how on earth did this remarkable rise and fall happen? Well firstly, the same strategy which got them to the top was to promote youth players or find bargains through their black box strategy and then sell them on for higher sum, which they could then reinvest and continue the cycle. However, as the years went on, their academy stopped producing gems, with James Ward-Prowse being their last real success story, with the midfielder having first broke through over a decade ago now. And the reason for much of this occurred in 2014, where both Cortese and Mitchell departed the Saints, being replaced by Ralph Kruger and Ross Wilson, who had both gone to underperform, especially Kruger, who was a former hockey coach with no experience in football. What had made the Saints' transfer strategy so good in years gone by was the way that different departments could work together, but with the longer that Kruger was in charge, the more distant things got. 
players started being signed by either managers or the higher ups with little consultation between the two, leading to a squad made up of different players that didn't work together, only made worse by a managerial merry-go-round which saw five different people in the dugout over a two and a half year spell. The likes of Poch and Komen were attack-minded managers who'd built up an intense and attacking squad, compared to Puel and Pellegrino who preferred slower, more defensive approaches of play. Following that, Mark Hughes came in and didn't make his mark on the squad at all, being replaced by Hassan Hutor as the side looked to go back to their former ways. This was further built upon through the arrival of Matt Crocker in January 2020 who oversaw big upgrades to the training ground and youth academy, before the side was once again sold last year to a Serbian consortium who failed to really invest massive sums of money, something similar to what we saw with Zhao Zhisheng. Of course, Southampton have gone back to signing young promising players as well as focusing on bringing up the best the championship has to offer which can be seen through acquisitions like Livramento, Lavia, Armstrong and Nathan Jones. However, thus far it's failed to replicate the former success of the site, seemingly leaving them in a mess. However, it may not all be bad. Their signings this season have all seemed promising and perhaps aren't represented fairly in their league position, which in my opinion is more down to their failures in years gone by. And so even if they do go down this season, I would not be surprised at all if they bounce back up stronger than before and use it as a reset button for the future. I guess what I'm trying to say is that despite things looking terrible in the South Coast right now, the Saints have proven in the past they do know how to build a good side. And so, if they can continue to build with signings like Lavia, Livramento, Sulemano and so on, do not be surprised if over the next few years we see Southampton start that cycle again and rise back up to the top of English football. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe if you did. Importantly though, links to all my socials are in the description. But for now, enjoy your day.